believe that there are some keys to getting prayers answered in the spirit. I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt, if you are tired of prayers being unanswered, you need to pay attention to what I'm preaching to you tonight because I'm going to give you something that gives you a key on how to get prayers answered from God. There was a very powerful prophet that lived back in the 50s and 60s, died way too young. His name was Verbal Bean. He was a very powerful man of God. He was a man of prayer. He, he was a powerful powerful man of prayer. He said there were two types of prayers that God answers. He said there are two types of praying that will get God's attention. He said the first type of prayer that God answers is a memorial prayer. It's something that you pray about over and over and over and then God answers it. He said like Cornelius when he prayed so many times that the angel of the Lord said your prayer and your giving has come up as a memorial before God. He said it was like this. He said, if a man wanted to buy a suit, but could not afford the suit, he would go into the suit store with the money he had and put the suit on layaway with the funds that he had. Next time he got paid, he would put some more funds down on the suit. He would not leave with the suit. He would leave without the suit each time he went in to make a payment. But the more payments he made on the suit, when he could make them, there would become a day when he would finally pay off the suit. And when the last payment was made, he could take what he had been paying for home with him. He said, that's how it is in your prayer life. You can be praying about something over and over and over and not take the answer home. If you keep praying and you keep believing, there's going to come a day when you bring the answer home with you because you've paid it in full. Hallelujah. Your bodies have just been disconnected from their deficiencies. And the Lord just brought back to my memory at the same accessible point. Heaven's open. Faith is receptive. I looked up in... Ken, Brother Ken Gurley's church in Pearland, Texas, and the ceiling opened up. And then the heavens opened up and it started to rain. I really didn't know what I was saying this morning. I did in context of what I was saying. But when I asked for rain, I was thinking of the harvest. But when God heard it, He sent it back in another form, and it came to me just now in prayer. We've hit that form. When I looked up and saw, it was cells, like what you see in a microscope. It was raining cells in Pearland, Texas. I said, God, I've never seen this before. What What are you doing? He said, I am restoring the cell base of my creation. After service, a woman walked up. She said, Brother Hernandez, when you told that over the pulpit, because I ran to the pulpit just after that, it was already the altar service. And I said that, and the place exploded in worship. And it's so thick in here. There are, I can hear whirlwinds of angels. Every time people would shout, I would hear a greater shout in this atmosphere here tonight. And she walked up there and said, I had just finished saying, God, I've had two open heart surgeries. I don't need another one. What I really need, God, God, is if you would just rebuild my cells. And she said, it was 30 seconds and you said that. It's raining cells in here right now. God's not just... God's not just removing... He's not just removing a sickness. He's rebuilding that segment of your physical frame. If you don't know science, a little bit of science indicates that we have about 100 million cells in our bodies. They're broken into groups. That's why they call them brain cells, etc., etc. So every section has a group. And when the group breaks down, it's when infection comes in and you start to get sick. God is restoring, I think there's 31 sections. God is restoring each section of your cell base. So lift your hands. Let it rain on you. Let it rain on you. Let it rain on you. 
Let it come to the Haraka Satala Borokotai. Let it rain on your brain particles. Let it rain on your physical heart particles. Satakori Hata Kalahai. Let, let it kandeko rehasata. Let it rain on your skeletal structure. Koro o soto koto lo hoto. The deterioration that happened in your degenerative genealogical gene base. Let it be restored back to your skeletal structure. Kore ko shata la boroko tunahai. God, I speak to the DNA that was created, which started the cell-based multiplication in the mother's womb. I pray now that you reach into the DNA, God, and whatever needs to change in the DNA, let the cells of heaven reshape, reform the formula. Lord, because you are the one that created the formula of the cell base and whatever needs to change in the formula be, be seated continue to worship the Lord your altar has caught, your altar has caught God's attention tonight. Your altar has created a scent. The scent has caught God's nostrils. And you're hitting the dimension of multiplication. Because when a particular scent comes into the nostrils of God, He's compelled by the scent to release multiplication. I'm going to talk about that scent in just a moment. But there's something that's happened in the shifting of the spirit world, not just because we sung and worshipped and praised, but we have reached a perpetual tipping point of the spirit realm where petition is really pretty minute compared to what's affecting God. You're getting to his heart by scent. If you study the world of perfumes, you'll know that perfumes trigger the emotional seat of a human being. That's why they create perfumes to try to amen. And that's why they name them what they do. They're trying to trigger something. Your scent of worship is like a perfume before God. And that scent has triggered his heart. When you trigger God's heart, you trigger his hand. And something has happened in the atmosphere where God is literally just starting to loose, not blessings, gifts. The perpetual motion of multiplication is being spread like a blanket, like the rain I explained. So I want you to continue worship. We're going in and out of different segments. Let me... Prepare your mind to attach itself to what's happened with the spirit already. So your mind can possibly get to the place where it catches literally a perception that will literally transform the way you come to God. Not just here, not just now, but every day when you're driving in your car. I'm telling you, this visitation is about to become common in uncommon places. I said this visitation is about to become common in uncommon places. That's what unity does. Unity causes, amen, the visitation of God to become common in uncommon places. When you least expected it would happen at that 
particular location. That's the place where God is going to literally saturate. Amen. That circum, amen, vented situation where you're living, doing, being, driving, having, eating. You've hit, before I even mentioned it, you've hit the subject of altars that multiply. Since the beginning of mankind, after the sin nature of man, there's always been altars. There always will be until we get to the throne. They've forever defined destinies and direction of mankind. Since Cain and Abel, there's been altars. You can find altars throughout the Word of God. Cain's offering simply wasn't accepted because it came through talents and ability, and that doesn't require an altar. When you have to have an altar, that's when God, amen, gets your attention. That's why altars are so, amen, perpetually important because his didn't need blood and his didn't need fire, but Abel's did. Abel's required an altar and it required blood and it required fire. It was sacrificial in content. And when he got the attention, amen, he got the attention of God because there was an altar. There's really after that no mention much about altars until after the flood where Noah, amen, sacrificed before the Lord and he got one word from God and that word was encapsulated with multiplication because if you'll notice at Noah's altar after the flood he did not even mention the flood He literally worshipped God. Why? Because the conditions weren't the supply for his altar. That's why you don't hear, amen, about altars in the ark. Because your storm should never be the reason for your altars. Because if it is, your altars finish after the storm. Amen. But your altars come by reason of the storm in the form of worship. Because you understand that worship, which is what you started to tap into the first night with Brother Willoughby. Can I tell you something about Brother Willoughby? The hardest time he had with his faith was right before he died. I walked in his room. He couldn't get up out of his chair. He was sick as could be. And the reason it was hard for him because he told me personally pay, pray Peter's prayer. I thought, oh Steve. I said, I'll pray for your faith that it fail not. The reason why is he couldn't get up out of that chair and dance. He was stuck to the chair. Couldn't get up. And when he lost his his form of worship to God that was so, as Pastor Stark has mentioned, was so prolific in the presence of the Lord, it was hard for him to attach himself to his faith in God. Why? Because your worship, amen, becomes the fuel to your faith. That's why an altar can never turn into a positional seat. It has to stay as a fragrance. You have loosed a fragrance here tonight. (laughs) And God doesn't have a word for your thought process. He has a word for your destiny. Inside of your destiny, say my destiny is going to multiply. Say it. (laughs) Say, my destiny is going to multiply. See, worship causes, triggers multiplication. When you get to worshiping God, God doesn't look at how He can bless you. God starts looking at how He can multiply you. Your praise will get God's attention to bless you, but your worship... He's not looking just to bless you, Brother Mark. He's trying to figure out now that, now that you've got my attention in worship, let me now create a path how everything you touch will multiply. 
where one turns to a hundred, where a hundred turns to a thousand, where a thousand turns to ten thousand. Now that the fragrance has caused my heart to trigger, listen to this scripture in Genesis chapter 8, verse number 20, where Noah builds an altar unto the Lord and takes of every clean beast. Why? Because when you get to worship, you've already repented. When you get to worship, you've already cleansed your heart. When you get to worship, you've already cleansed your hands. When you get to worship, you've already cleansed your mind. When you get to worship, you're not wondering what God's thinking. When you get to worship, you've already tapped the love dimension of God. When you get to worship, the relational portion is active. When you get to worship, that's the reason that you get God's attention. He's not dealing with the fragments of the flesh or humanity. He now has the soul, amen, connected with the Spirit. Hallelujah. And it creates, everybody say it creates. It creates a scent. Why? Because there's no stench of flesh. When you were worshiping God the way you were just a moment ago, you weren't thinking about all the stuff you're going through, were you? No, of course not. Why? Because you got into soul-based worship. You disconnected the human spirit and connected the soul chamber. Now you're just like, at that moment, you're just like Adam in the garden. Before sin. When that begins to happen, there's something that draws God. Lift your hands and worship. Let it rain, let it rain, let it rain, let it rain, let a kudo hoshe, he's sick boom. And a koso hore hase, a katahota lehata kaye, a sakare hota son de lehata. Clean worship, clean worship, clean worship. Clean worship. And took of every clean beast and every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. There was no regret. There was no remorse. He realized, I accept this as a God thing. Everybody say that. I accept this as a God thing. For what purpose? For an offering. The soul moves God because it's worship. The Bible says, and the Lord smelled a sweet savor. What does it say next? And the Lord said in his heart, When did the Lord say in his heart, after he smelt a sweet savor? You know when God starts talking out of his heart? (laughs) When the scent changes from down here and it reaches up there. God starts making decisions based on what your altar smells like. What? Is your altar going to smell like in 2018? If your altar continues to smell like this, oh God. God's going to make some decisions out of His heart that He may have not made because of the timing, lest He first smelt the smell. Doesn't the Bible say they shall know you by your fruit? Can you not smell fruit? 
I used to have four trees in the last house we had in California. I could close my eyes and find the tree. I didn't need to have my eyes open to find the tree because I could find it by following my nose. For some reason, God has used scent as a trigger point. And so God looks for a scent to come off our altars that will literally trigger his heart. You think your obedience triggers God's heart? No, your obedience only gets you to worship. You think obeying the law that's been laid down in righteousness in the New Testament code is what's going to get you access to the heart of God? No, that simply gets you aligned for your worship. Once all those things, amen, line up and you begin to worship like we've been worshiping the last 30 minutes or so, there's something that happens in the corridors of heaven. I don't know where we were, but Kathy, my wife, was at home and she... I told you the story before she went to the park chair. He was playing in the little swing sets over there. And two ladies walked up to my wife and said, What's the perfume you have on us? It's the most beautiful perfume we've ever smelt. And she said, I could feel a wind start to blow. I didn't really think of it. She's quite melancholy. And she thought, Well, I didn't take a bath this morning. I took one yesterday, but I haven't taken a bath today. She said, I, I, I was trying to think what kind of cream did I put on, what kind of perfume. She said, No, I didn't do that either. She said, I, I don't know. I, I honestly don't. They said, well, whatever it is, it is the most amazing perfume we've ever smelt in our lives. And, and so they went on and they had to leave and took their kids. And she said, I was just standing there kind of rehearsing what just happened. And then I felt the wind again. And then I smelt the perfume. Hmm. How is it that wind being spirit And perfume came in the same wave. There's something about spiritual worship (laughs) that triggers scent. Try it again. Lift your hands again. Try it again. Trigger the scent. (laughs) Because your altar is about to multiply. Mm. Lord, I know by what I sense and what I understand and what I've experienced, we've already gotten, Lord, to the integral part of this relational attachment that has come into your nostrils and gotten to your heart. This is where fear leaves because love starts casting out fear. Perfect love is found at this juncture. And at this juncture is where God begins to cast off. You won't need that, and you won't need that, and you won't need that, and you won't struggle with that, and you won't battle with that. I want you to say, I let go. Say it again, I let go. What you're letting go of are the cyclic patterns that try to rule the mind, that try to bind us into praying based on the perplexities of of the cycles of the flesh. Instead of getting to this place where God chooses what he just unties and disconnects and reattaches back to you that's from his throne. You see, when, when you get in this relational vein right here where we're at, this, this, this sweet savor hmm, starts getting God to disconnect curses. Watch this. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. 
For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. God begins to disconnect what the weakness and frailty of frame has such trouble with. God just sends a word and disconnects at this particular juncture. So I want you to let the stuff that you've wrestled with in 2017 just kind of fade into the mouth of God and let him right now curse amen that thing that is cursed you and let God just go ahead and disconnect and make a covenant amen with your deliverance. Make a covenant with how he's going to separate that thing from your world that you're 20 2018 is not some battleground of just trying to overcome stuff you know God can help you with but hasn't been able to. So throw your hands in the air and throw your voice into the same. And let God out of his love chamber, amen, speak a perfect love that cast out fear and disconnect the torment because fear has torment, but the Lord in love disconnects the torment. No, no, I see. No, no, cause. Ne matis. And the core has a tie. Shalade. Shalade. Kari. Noah didn't ask for any of these things. Noah simply worshipped. And God said, While the earth remaineth, let me replace man's frailty with seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. He said, I'm loosing multiplication on the earth now. And putting into motion the Lord began to press upon me. He said, tell my people to leave the altar of needs and create the altar of worship. He said, I don't want my people coming to me with an altar full of needs. He said, I want them coming to me with an altar full of worship. And while they're worshiping, what was once a need, listen to these words, will now turn into a multiplication. So I want you to dust off your altar right now. Just in your mind, and your spirit, just dust off your altar. Just clear off. Clear off the components. Of, I threw away my prayer list because I, I, I couldn't do it anymore. I, I, I just I, I still mention people's names and circumstances and situations, but that's usually the last thing I do. I, I just I can't seem to approach God with a list anymore. I just I, there's something in me that keeps saying, "Hey, can we get back to where we left off?" When I went to bed last night, there was something that moved in my atmosphere, and I want to wake up in that same atmosphere, God. God, 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 I'm, I'm asking you, can we, can we pick up where we left off? Because I want to get back into that. I don't know what you did through the night. I'm not even checking my phone yet. But something happened in the night, God. And I want to reiterate that point and that particular move, God. I don't know where I was exactly. I can't define it all. But, God, I refuse to allow my storm to define my worship. Mm. Mm. Lay your hand on somebody and say, Seed time and harvest is upon you. 
multiplication just hit your soul chamber. Tell them multiplication just hit your soul. That's it, talking tongues. That's okay. Multiplication. Multiplication. Send, send, receive our send. Receive our send. That's why all that other disobedience was a stench in his nostrils. Isn't that how the the Bible coins it as a stench in his nostrils? Why? Because those actions created a sin. Right? Rebellion, stubbornness, all that stuff. It creates a sin. God gets a whiff of it. Responds. Some of you are about to create a sin this year. It's going to get God to respond to stuff that's never moved. You, you, I, Isaiah in chapter 5 created a kind of a complaining scent, you know, until he got to the woe is me. When he got to the woe is me, he got to worship. When he got to worship, something started moving in the atmosphere. He perceived different. He, he sensed different. He operated different. He talked different. Everything changed. Everything changes at the altar, and then everything changes after that. Genesis 12 says that Abram left this familiar place, left familiar family, people, went to a land that didn't know much about and certainly couldn't Google it. And he made this altar. He made this altar, God said, I'm going to make of you a great nation. I'll bless you. I'll make your name great. I'll make you to the point where you're a blessing. Everybody that gets around you gets blessed just because of your atmosphere. Can I tell you something, Calvary? You're getting to a place where your atmosphere... Is blessing people. Just because of your atmosphere. People come in here. Get delivered. Get set free. Get blessed. Walk away lifted. You know what's happening to you? It's not favor. It's, it's attraction. There's an attraction because of the sin that's beginning to come before God. And when it comes before God, it affects man. That's why Jacob's turnaround, amen, had such a incredible difference, favor with God and man after, amen, God had to wrestle with him. Because really, that, that's another subject, and we may get to it, we may not. Amen. But Abraham departs as the Lord had spoken to him. Lot goes with him, and uh, seven. And five years he is at this point, and he takes Sarai, his wife, and they go down and gets over here to over the plain at Moray, and Canaanites are in the land, and the Lord appears to Abram and he said, Under thy seed will I give this land, and he starts just loosing all kinds of edicts of what's going to happen in his life, and Abraham doesn't. Shout he worships. Something about this worship that kept attracting him regardless. See, when it's 
worship. It's not based on the condition. It's based on the one who you're worshiping. That's why whether he was worshiping in the plain or whether he was worshiping on Mount Moriah, it was still worship because the condition didn't define his praise. The conditions were just the side element of the fact that he was going to worship God. See, if you get to worship, then worship becomes something that's not tied to condition. I want you to get the concept tonight and carry it with you through this year that every time I worship, I'm going to create a scent in the nostrils of God. Perfume is going to come out of my altar. Whether you're in a trial, it'll still be worship. Whether you're in some trouble, it will still be worship. Whether you're on a mountain top, it will still be worship. The sin doesn't change. Because it's not condition based, it's Him based. Check your bodies right now. Who got healed? Who got healed during these last 45 minutes or so? Who got healed? Raise your hand. Check your body. If you got healed, raise your hand. If you got healed, raise your hand. If you got healed, check it out. Move around. Check. Some of you may have to go get checked to check. And that's okay, too. But I want you to raise your hand if you had physically something drop off of you. Check it. Move around. Run around. Roll. Bend. Whatever. Twist. Dance. Break. Dance if you have to. That's kind of former rain. Anybody? Raise your hand if you got healed. You know why? He's not doing it from the outside in. He's doing it from the inside out. Your cell base is the core of your health level. Your numbers, diabetic, your numbers are changing now. Think about it. Your cell base is being restored. It's not a quick fix. God is coming into the core. Mm. He's coming to the core of where your health is. He's restoring health to thy navel. Like when you were born and you came out of your mother's womb, you're attached to an umbilical. The umbilical reaches into heaven and God is coming into the core. That's why some of you feel you feel like refreshed. You know what's happening to you? Your cell base is being restored. A childhood ailment that you had is going to leave completely within three months and 90 days. The cell base of your childhood weaknesses are going to be swallowed up and the healing of the Lord is taking the next 90 days. So the fatigue that's been in your body will no longer be and you'll wonder where it is went and it's because God has literally replaced the damaged cells in your body and he's making you completely whole from the core base out not from the outside in that makes sense did that make sense yeah because you've had some little trickle of a drawing that's been taken from you and God stopped the trickle like the woman with the issue of blood and stopped it. Now the reversal order is taking place inside of your life. Let me talk to you, brother, and let me tell you, I know God doesn't heal old age. Billy Cole taught us that. Amen. But God does miracles. I understand that. So I want you to take what God has put inside of your body now and let it now begin to trickle through the arteries of your frame. Take it in like a vitamin drink that you, amen, take in and trust
trust that it's going to sustain you. This is not about sustaining you. This is about replenishing and restoring what was broken down. Rendo sukori katale horo rekosha. Every time you hit your altar of worship this year, God will replenish more. God will restore more. Le ro suke nika daye koro no more. Tata kala haranai. What's that stuff that gives you a bunch of energy in like five seconds? You drink it and it's in. Yeah, like the five hour energy stuff and all that. This isn't that. That's just a shot in the arm. God's not shooting you in the arm. He's losing multiplication. So the stuff that consumes your time won't consume your time. Deep. Deep's calling unto deep in this house. Water spouts are spurting all over the sanctuary. It's like we've stepped into a minefield of fresh fountains. It's like we've stepped into a minefield of fresh, amen, waters coming out of the deep in the desert where the rose blossoms as Isaiah prophesied and talked about. You've stepped into fountains of the deep. Go ahead. Head, lift your voice, lift your soul. Let the fountains of the deep produce a multiplicity of what God has already loosed upon. Amen. Your soul, base to the core of our frame. Isaac said to Jacob, excuse me, Isaac said to Abraham, he said, Dad, we've got the wood and the fire, but where's the lamb? He said, don't worry about the lamb. He said, the Lord will provide himself a lamb. How do you know that, Dad? Because... Anytime there's worship, there'll be provision. And this is what God told me to tell somebody. I don't know who you are. God didn't tell me that. But there's several somebodies in here I think that could receive this. And he said, and I quote, If you will take care of your altar, I will take care of your ram. Because it was the ram, remember, that was stuck in the thicket after Abraham went to slay his son and the angel stopped him. And he turned around and there was a ram in the thicket. And God told me to tell you, take care of your altar this year. Don't let anything, anybody, any circumstance interrupt the worship of your altar. And if you'll handle your altar, he will handle your ram. <laughs> See, it only takes one generation to lose the altar. And then when the next generation tries to bring the altar back, they don't understand what it's about. So they'll turn what used to be worship into blessing. Who's the guy that didn't have much for altars? His name's Isaac. He doesn't have many altars. Why? He lived off his dad's. You don't find many scriptures about Isaac's altars. He lived off his dad's altars. Matter of fact, when he finally did, quite frankly, out of desperation, he created an altar in the 26th chapter of Genesis. It says it right there. I was 
taken back a bit that when Isaac went to do an altar because he wasn't familiar with worship at altars that God had to make the reference of his dad not him because it says in verse 24 of Genesis 26 and the Lord appeared unto him the same night and said I am the God of Abraham thy father fear not for I am with thee and I will bless thee and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. He said, I receive your altar, but I receive it in the name of the one that learned how to worship me. I'm telling you, work on your altar this year. God's about to produce something out of your altar that you cannot produce out of your own habitual patterns no matter how hard you try. And God is about to have respect toward you because of your altar. God, my Lord. I said, God is about to have respect unto you. You say, God is no respecter of persons. That's only on the subject of salvation. Check the content. Amen. He does have respect towards people. Read Leviticus when he talks about having respect for those that are connected with the vineyard or the vintage, if you will. God does have respect to persons. And I'm telling you in the Holy Ghost that if you'll work on your altar, he will have respect toward you because of what you bring before him don't depend on somebody else's altar because if you depend on somebody else's altar you are bound to produce a Jacob when you have an Isaac lifestyle and Isaac wasn't a bad guy it's just he never got to the pinnacle of worship and worships the peak of how to have a relationship with God. And Isaac never learned that process because he always watched daddy worship, but he never created time to make his own. Let me talk to the young people. you got to start somewhere. And this Bible reading thing that they've engaged in this church is one of the best opportunities for you to get involved. That's what I've got my daughter in right now. She said, Dad, God's been talking to me all the time. He's been talking to me a bunch of stuff. I said, tell me what he's saying. I want to hear it, sweetie. I said, I want to hear the revelation through the filter of a 16-year-old. I want to hear, man, we, we're having conversations. Even when I'm here, we have actually an app that, that allows the family to interact in the Bible reading. So everybody posts. You can see what each other have posts. And I'm like, she's getting it. She's, you know what's happening? I don't want to create an altar because then she'll inevitably create a Jacob. I don't want to create an Isaac because inevitably she will create a Jacob. You cannot produce an Isaac and not produce a Jacob. If you produce an Isaac, you will produce a Jacob. I don't want to have to deal with producing a Jacob because you, here's, here's the bottom line. You waste 20 years in the process. I can show you in scripture. Remember that whole Esau scenario with Jacob? Remember that one? That's a 20 year long process. I don't think we have 20 years. I mean, we may, but I don't think so. It's it's kind of getting close. So I am hearing God saying, I need some altars. Because I'm about to loose multiplication upon the earth. And the place I'm going to loose it is where I find altars of worship. God. So, so Isaac has, has this one altar encounter he produces to Jacob. So Jacob doesn't really know altars at all. He, he, uh, he only heard about his grandpa's altars. He only really kind of at a distance understood the stories of his grandpa's altar. He heard them, amen, like, like kids hear stories of the elders. And, and so he wants to have altars, but he really doesn't have any guidance of how to produce altars. So when Jacob, amen, comes into his own. He creates altars, but when you read his altars, they sound different than his grandpa's. When you hear Abraham's altars, it's all about worship. And don't don't sing that hard of God and I'm, it's all about you. Don't sing that song tonight, okay? I know it sounds like it would fit, but don't don't do that. 
right? Because we're, we're way beyond that. We, we are in a celestial zone. Where, like you said, Pastor Jimmy Stark, anything can happen at any time. So I want you to catch, catch the wave. Charity sends your love, okay? But God sends his love too. And his love is forming something in you that cannot be formed by your own heritage. It is being formed because you have found a corner with God. And you keep repeating that visitation. And because of that visitation, the Lord is going to give you gifts and callings above your qualification. Because you're not qualified to get what's coming on you. But because of a place that you have found with him, he's going to go ahead and advance you a gifting that's above your character. So now you're going to have to work on your character because your character is going to have to match your gifting. But the gifting's already been released upon you. I'm telling you, at any time, catch what happens in the atmosphere because you have the heart of God right now. You've got His attention and what comes to you by reason of His Spirit is by reason of our worth. Jacob didn't really know how to process it, so he he processed it. He processed it the best way that he knew. You can hear some of his prayers in the form of Genesis twenty eight and twenty. If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, listen to his subject matter. And will give me bread to eat. What? Why are you asking for stuff that's an automatic supply in the thicket? What are you asking for, Jacob? Provisions on the earth when heaven is ready to attend to you? This doesn't sound like your grandpa. Your grandpa never had to ask for the stuff because the stuff showed up because of his worship. Are you hearing me? Somebody talk to me. You, you, you understand where, where God's coming from tonight. He, he's not trying to make you feel bad. He's trying to give you a revelation so the next time you go to prayer, say, ah, all that stuff's going to take care of itself. God, God, here's the stuff that's going to happen. But, but before we even, even talk or think or, or perceive about that, I just want to worship you for the next hour. I want to create a sin, God. Once you catch the sin, then we'll talk about whatever you want to talk about. But I just want to create a sin. Man, there's so many. There's, I almost said it incorrectly. There's so many angels in this room. It's like this perpetual world, and I keep feeling stuff come by me and through me and around me. It's amazing what's flooding this atmosphere. I don't have to have a great sensation to feel that. It's just it's it's like I'm being turned by the spirit. I've been hit by a demon before when I was in Dominican Republic. It hit me in the chest, knocked me over in my back. My head hit a pointed rock, and I didn't even get a bruise. And I got up and got mad, and we prayed twelve people through to the Holy Ghost in a place where three years went by before anybody had received the Holy Ghost in that east, uh, whatever region of Dominican Republic it was right by Haiti. Amen. And and Brother Shirley just told me, he said, man, the churches have tripled. What happened? Multiplication hit. Amen. So I thought, I know what it feels like for the devil to try to throw a little blow at me to barely knock me on the ground and don't even get a scratch out of the deal. That's nothing. When I start feeling the whirlwinds of God, I thought, he's not just moving around me. He's moving around components that exist way beyond where I'm at. You know what it compels me to do? Doesn't it make you want to just throw your hands in the air right now and worship the Lord? It's an automation. Why? You've got the heart of God. Understand this is the feeling you get when you get the heart of God. This are these components that begin to swirl when you get the heart of God. Reshukori Rend 
rendo sure hata rendo kure busha reko tu that's why you don't need music at this level that's why you don't even have to run the aisles or shout amen why because reko su rendo lebo these elements and components are built into this whole scent piece <sighs> Jacob Jacob, I want you to, I want you to get back to grandpa's type of worship. I, I gotta get you there, Jacob. I can do this. Give me, I'm gonna work with you. I'm gonna take stuff out of you, but I'm gonna have to wrestle with you. Cause your prayer base. It's circumstance based. It's not worship. And we can only get you to the level of blessing if it's based on circumstance. But if I can get you to the level of worship, your circumstances will automatically start getting blessed the way I want them to be blessed. So you go through a whole dialogue of Jacob's life in 32 and 33. He gets, you know, I, to the point where God, uh, there's a man that wrestles with Jacob and, and he picks a fight with Jacob and he, he touches the hollow of his thigh. And even at that point, Jacob's trying to negotiate and he makes a statement in the middle of the wrestling match. I will not let you go until you. <laughs> I thought, wait. What? You're still looking for a blessing and angels showed up? Don't you know what God's trying to trigger out of you, Jacob? He's trying to get you to worship. Because if you get to worship, Israel starts manifesting. And, and, and you know, the, 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 the greatest point of that story, I think, is probably in Genesis 30. 3 and 20 when he erects there an altar and he calls it El Elohe Israel. And I went back to start looking up the details of El Elohe Israel. It actually means, listen to this, Israel worships the mighty God. He got to it. <laughs> he got to worship. He touched worship. And when he touched worship, things started shifting. To the point that God received that altar of worship in chapter 33. And then you go all the way to chapter 35. And God appears to Jacob again. But this time when he comes out of Paran Aram and he blesses him. And God says to him, thy name is Jacob. Thy name shall not be called anymore Jacob. But Israel, he brings it back to his attention. In other words, I heard you. I heard you at Shechem. It reached my throne. You got to me, Jacob. You've now learned how to worship. Now here's what I'm going to do for you. Why? Because God didn't say any of this kind of stuff until he hit worship. Amen. Israel. Israel worships the mighty God. <laughs> the name Jacob shall no more be called, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. Well, he already called his name Israel. Three chapters before, two chapters before, he'd already called his name Israel, right? So he comes back, he says, your name's going to be Israel. In other words, what I gave you is now going to stick because you brought it before me in worship. You are no longer coming on the preface of blessing. You are now coming on the preface of worship. He said, I'm God Almighty. Watch this. Watch these words. Verse number 11. And God said unto him, I am God Almighty. He reminded him, I received your worship as Israel. God Almighty, I worship you. He said, I heard you when you said that. Now let me come back as that, not just your blesser, not just your provider, not just your sustainer. Let me come back to you now as God Almighty. Watch the next words. Be fruitful and multiply. He said, now you're ready. You hit worship. Now I'm going to trust you with multiplication. 
you get to worship this year. And you will hit the trigger point of multiplication. I know you guys aren't texting. You're writing notes. I'm smart enough to know that. I'm not that old. Praise the Lord. (laughs) And when you hit this particular point, he says, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations. Everybody say a company of nations. See, you've reached, you've reached the effect of the spirit domain in the local area. And then you went to a few countries. But do you realize when you hit this level, you don't just go to a multiple of nations. You hit a company of nations. You know what a company is of nations? A company is that which is affected by reason of its tie. In other words, you know, you know what the 60-40 window is, right? You've probably heard of it. It's an old, it's an old thought process of, of the uh, calculation of Asia and the window there that's open. Well, it's because they're tied together. It's like when you go to Pakistan, you're not just touching Pakistan. You're really touching India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, and China because they're all connected together. It's the five points that connect it. So when you hit one point, you're really touching five points in the spirit world because they're all connected. When he talks about a company of nations, what he's saying to you is your worship has brought you to a level where I can entrust when you affect Brazil it's more than Brazil you affect an entire region in that portion of the world when you go amen to China you're not just affecting China when you go to Vietnam it's not just Vietnam it's affecting an entire company of nations why? because everything you do from this point forward is not just individual it's multiplied Clap again. Clap again. Clap again. Soroko recata. Clap again. That's it. Put your voice with 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 it. Parehesoto. Herakosoto. Herima. Lift your hands, don't say anything. God's pouring into you right now. Take it. And then write it down. And when God speaks to you, start clapping your hands. When God speaks to you, just start clapping your hands like raindrops on a tin roof. Now let's all clap our hands. You say, well, God didn't speak to me. No, He bypassed your mind because the thing He put in you is too big and your mind doesn't have the ability to filter it. So some of you, He spoke through your mind, but some of you, he had to bypass your mind because your faith wouldn't have been able to receive what he just put there. Example, laughing in the spirit for four hours, as I've told you before. God bypassed my mind because if God would have told me you're going to China, I would have rebuked it because I didn't like China. And I didn't like several things about the whole scenario, which I won't get into details. So God had to bypass my brain and put it into my spirit. Because my brain wouldn't have received it. Because God had to reveal some things to me. So he puts it into my spirit. Three months later, Bishop Steve Willoughby called me and said, God just spoke to me and said, you're supposed to go to China. And I said, you're right. I am. 
And that opened the door to India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, where 3,000 received the Holy Ghost two years ago in one service. Nepal, the bridge to the five connecting points. I wasn't asking God to go overseas. I was in the Spirit worshiping Him. When He planted it into my spirit. (laughs) So I want you to stand up, come to the altar, and just start worshiping. Whether it's a dance or a bow or a walk or a talk. Or a roll. Well, I don't know what it is. You know what it is. And just surrey opened the gate. Multiplication is happening to an altar that's full of worship. Second type of prayer is a current prayer. He said a current prayer is the second type of prayer that God answers. It's it's a situation that you do not have you don't have a long time for God to do this. You need God to do it now. Does that make sense? Yeah, you, you can have a lost loved one. You can that's a memorial thing. You just pray until God does something, but you could have a situation where you need God to intervene now. And when you have that type of prayer, memorial prayer is not what you need. You can't just go bring the name up or bring the situation up in passing and say, God, I'm making another payment on this. I need you to come through. When the situation is desperate, it requires desperation in your prayers. A current prayer. You can't come with a situation, Brother Grant, that's tragic and real and severe and come to God and give God a, you know, Lord, what we're going through right now. And I need you to come through because the deadline is this week and we have to answer. We need some peace. We need a miracle and walk out. That's, there's no desperation there. You're giving God the right facts, but you're not giving God the heart behind the facts. You're showing God, I'm really not serious about this. Because a current prayer requires desperation. It requires you to be, I need an answer now. I don't have 60 years to pray about this. We need a miracle in our house. That is desperation. That's a current prayer. And a current prayer, God will hear. And I want to show you something. That that the Lord answers prayers while you're praying them. I know that we've got God in this box that if I pray today, he can come through by Thursday or he can come through by tomorrow. He can come through by next month. But actually God, the Bible said, I can hear you before you even say what you're going to say. In fact, I need Jesus. I know what you're saying before you even ask.